Welcome back to WNST, Towson Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, positively into March, and, you know, it's going to feel like May here in a couple of minutes. I don't know what the heck happened to my scratch off. There it is, the Maryland Lottery. We're going to be doing the crab cake tour, uh, and this guy is... He's had a few crab cakes in his day, being a real Baltimore. We're going to be over Costas on the 5th of April, celebrating 50 years of the Maryland Lottery. I'll have some old-school scratch-offs. Dick Girardi probably remembers these old-school instant lotteries from back in the day. Also, our friends at Window Nation, 866-90-NATION. Uh, and uh, I got my new windows, and I'm getting ready for spring has sprung. All right. But Jason Dick Girardi around uh, for a couple weeks. He is one of the voices of Penn State. Uh, Dick grew up here in Baltimore. Uh, we, we were colleagues at one point at Sports First and News American back in 1984. Uh, if I have show and tell for you, Dick, I'm going to text my wife and have her bring some show and tell in because I found an old News American you'd be interested in. Ooh, Dick has been nice. at the Philadelphia Daily News for forever. He's in sort of semi-retirement. Uh, they, they don't shoot old horses. They send them to State College to uh, do Big Ten basketball. Uh, Dick, how the heck are you? And people don't know who the hell you are. They should Google you because you're a legend and you're one of my friends. How are you? Uh, I am Nestor. I'm fine. Yeah, it was a great hoop season uh, doing the Penn State games. Got all the way to the Big Ten championship game. Uh, got into the second round. Actually had a three point lead over Texas with four and a half minutes to go in Des Moines. So, yeah, it was a, it was a great run, uh, especially the month of March. Uh, they played eight games in 18 days. It was a wild scene from Evanston to State College to Chicago and finally to Des Moines, Iowa. So yeah, it was a lot of fun and watching a team over a period of months get better and better, break the Big Ten record for most threes in a season, have the first All-American up there in six decades. So yeah, it was, it was definitely a fun year. Dick, I I only ask you this, and I'll get into the basketball side of it. I went through this with Leonard Raskin, a little bit with Luke on the air the other day. I drove through Shrewsbury. I did some antiquing, and if my wife can come out of the office, I will actually have props for you to show you, which as an old news head, you'll appreciate, because they smell like the morgue at the News American. That's all I'm going to say. No, so you know that so. smell? You know that smell? Yes, I do. Okay. So, like an old library for anybody who wants, wonders what a morgue was and what the bullpen at the News American was. So, I drove up to State College. I had only been to State College one time in my life. It was in 1998. It was an awful day. Michigan beat the hell out of Penn State. The weather was bad. It was Charles Woodson, Courtney yep. Brown, LeVar Arrington, that era. Only time I mm -hmm. ever went. And I didn't really see the city because I drove in in the morning. It was a mess. RVs, right. big game, fog. It, you know, I just – but I did go into the Bryce Jordan Center to stay mm -hmm. warm that day, probably to look at girls. It was 1998. It was a long time ago. <laughs> So, and just to stay dry, probably that day. I went back up for Springsteen. I went on a Saturday night up to State College. And I got to just ask you, because when I think of you, no offense, I don't think of Penn State basketball. I think you probably were doing it for a long time before I realized you were doing it. Because you live in Philly. You're a basketball and a horse racing head, for the most part. And I don't know how you got the gig, although I know that there was a Philadelphia angle about how you got the gig. But just getting there, it's such a uniquely weird place. It snowed three times. They call it Happy Valley. I felt like I was in sort of a Disney world for college. I felt like Belushi was going to jump out from one of the, I felt like I was in real college for one of the first times ever for a couple of hours. So guys look like you and me with their sons and daughters drinking beer. The wrestling thing was that night mm -hmm. and you were playing. Mm -hmm. It was seven. I walked out of the lodge bar in downtown at six 15 to go see Springsteen. The place mm -hmm. was buzzing and it wasn't right. necessarily because of Springsteen. You know, it wasn't because of your basketball game, which was nice and it didn't have a good ending, but the wrestling thing, like I, I learned about, about state college and one day my friend Craig Lusco, but did you spend a lot of time there before? Like you were doing this? I, I did. I covered the football team from 1993 to 2004, like in the big 10 era, uh, they decided that they needed a full-time guy to do it when they went into the Big Ten. So I did that. I didn't go on a lot of the road trips because we didn't have a Sunday paper, but I was certainly up there a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I knew it very well before I got involved with the basketball back in 2004. When's the first time you went up there? As as a Baltimore kid that was a horse yeah. racing guy that went off to Philadelphia, yeah. I don't yeah. 
look, I know state college people, my friend, Ron Drager, my friend, Patty Cost, they went there, right. you know, mm-hmm. sneakies were God. I had a girlfriend that was just from Erie, Pennsylvania, back in my hammerjacks days. And I, you know, I was in love with her and we were five years. Like she, I never went there with her because like, she was so reverent about the bars and the gig <laughs> and the cream, like the people it's a cult. I mean, I you probably found that out with Santa. It's a cult. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but there's a part of it for me that, it was exploratory. I tried to get rid of my ticket and couldn't. So then once I found out like, okay, I am stuck into this ticket that cost too much money with a friend and I wanted to spend the evening. I'm like, I'm going to make a night of it. And he's like, we're not going to be able to park on a Saturday in state college. And I'm like, <laughs> listen, Dick, I'd never really looked at it on the map. I had never Googled mm-hmm. it. I've never had a reason to go there other than the Springsteen concert. And I found it to just be fascinating that if I had a 17 year old grandkid somewhere down the line, it's yeah, let's go up to see state college, maybe go to school there or whatever, but you've been involved and it's become much more of a basketball thing. And I'll leave this to you and talk some big 10 and some Terps uh, into this because everybody thought they had a punch. Purdue thought they were good, right? It's been such a strange year for basketball and i've spent the morning today with gary williams doing nothing but bitching about the baltimore media i watched gary speak literally this morning to the connects group so thank you very much keith miller and the folks at strategic factory but gary spoke for 500 people this morning and the basketball thing even he doesn't understand nil or like where this thing's going the whole thing feels like it's changed in five minutes since the plague it has changed completely. The whole sport has changed. Uh, I think if you're not, I mean, look at the University of Miami. They're a classic example. They have their men's and women's teams in the Sweet 16. And a lot of it, not all of it, they have obviously very good coaches. Jim Laranek is the men's coach. Uh, but they have, they have a particular person. There's a great story in The Athletic this week by my good friend Dana O'Neill about what that particular person has done to make Miami athletics viable through NIL money. And he's just one person doing it. It's all legal at this point, as far as everybody can tell. But yeah, if you're not in that uh, ballpark at this point, you're probably in trouble. There are places, I mean, FDU, an example, that can get through FAU into the Sweet 16. Penn State, frankly, does not have much NIL basketball money, but they have a great coach. They had uh, older players who just found a way to play that was great. But yeah, it absolutely has totally changed. I mean, look who's no longer around, right, the last five years. Roy Williams, gone. Bayheim gone. Krzyzewski, gone. Jay Wright, gone. It's not a coincidence. It's one of the reasons they got out, because the whole game had changed. Well, Dick, you're in Philly. Uh, I saw Jay Wright come. The last time I saw Gary, Jay Wright, mm-hmm. saw Jimmy Patzers. It was the Cal Ripken Foundation Hoops event that they do yeah. like in September, maybe October, yep. whatever it was. It, it was early, and I went, and that's the day where I heard Jay Wright and the current Villanova coach and, they, and Kevin Willard. I met Kevin Willard, shook his hand that day, um, talking about NIL. And obviously the Willards of the world have to be – ready for whatever this changes and it's interesting you'd say the miami thing because gary gary spoke for 45 minutes this morning so i mean Mm -hmm. inside the mind of gary and 80 percent of it was stuff that happened before 2002 really but he did mention the eight hundred thousand dollars for a kid in miami and five million to get this kid and that and the manning's kid five million right down to texas so what do you what would you teach me? You're an old fart, but a real journalist. You're smarter than most people I know. What if if you if I were to give you two minutes for my audience and to say, what do you understand about this? And wh- what's this wild, wild west? Because Gary's still talking about it like somebody in Indianapolis is going to come and fix this and somebody's going to step no. in. And I'm like, no, I think no. this is real wild. wild. There are, he said that he said the old old white guy thing. He's almost 80 guidelines he said there's gonna be there have to be guidelines and i'm like well when they made guidelines everybody ripped the rule book up and just fedex cash right so like where's it going well so here's what happened nestor uh the ncaa one of the uh history's worst organizations uh for years said look players can't get anything right so players and really kind of started around the fab five era when they were selling chris weber's jersey and chris weber is asking a perfectly valid question wait a second they're selling a jersey with my name on it and i get nothing and they said yeah that's right you get nothing that's it and be happy you signed here that's right be be (laughs) happy that you get what you get and too bad and then obviously sports on television money exploded 
in college basketball, college football, obviously the NFL, MLB, the NBA, coaches' salaries exploded. So the players are then saying, all right, hold on a second here. There's all this money in the game that nobody anticipated, and we still get nothing. Uh, so the O'Bannon lawsuit uh, really started this. They said, hey, we're, we deserve to get a piece. They wouldn't even, they were using their likenesses on the, on the video games. They still couldn't get anything. So as this got into court, and judges and finally the Supreme Court said, this is absurd that the people who uh, people are paying to go see get no piece of the action. So each court ruled, obviously, that the players are entitled to something. And while this was happening, the NCAA still did nothing, didn't come up with any guidelines, no regulations, said, oh, it'll never happen as they lost every case in court. And now it's at the point where there are no rules, there are no regulations, and it ain't gone back. It's the Wild West, and it, that's what it's going to be. Gary, I'm sorry for you, but my man, the game that you, you, you coached is over. It's just a different sport, and there's nothing the NCAA can do about it because every time they try to do something, they lose another court case. Well, Dick Girardi is our guest, uh, the legendary Philadelphia Daily. We're going to get to some horse racing at some point, as we know it. But <laughs> you and I are into Big Ten basketball, and you've been covering. How many years at Penn State have you been doing color now? This was my 19th season of doing Penn State basketball. And, yeah, there been, you know, it's interesting, Nestor. People don't know this, but the last six years, the program's really been very good. It's been a top 50 program for six years now. Six years ago, they won the NIT, should have been in the NCAA tournament, had really what was a sweet 16 team with a bunch of Philly kids as the stars on the team. Um, and then they've been in the top 50 in the Ken Palm every year but last year. And the only reason they weren't in last year is because the new coach came in, Micah Shrewsbury, and all the speed on the team left they, they because they could go immediately and play. Isaiah Brockington was one of the stars on that team two years ago. He was first team all Big 12 at Iowa State last year. Penn State would have been really good last year, too, uh, at the, all the players stayed. So, yeah, this has been a six-year run. I think people just discovered them this year because they got to the finals of the Big Ten, crushed Texas A&M and gave Texas, you know, all they needed in, in round two. But, yeah, it's really been a six-year progression. But prior to that, it was a struggle. There isn't any question about that through Ed DeCellis, who did the best he could. Of course, he's now at Navy. And then when Pat Chambers took over, and you mentioned Sandusky a little while ago, Chambers' first game was the first football game after the Sandusky thing broke. So talk about walking into a tough spot, not just in football, but in basketball, too. It, it impacted every part of the university for a number of years, including the men's basketball program. Well, I saw Springsteen. I went into Bryce Jordan. Uh, my buddy's like, I, I like it. It's all one level. And I'm like, there's no room in here. The place is ill-equipped. I said, I hope there's not a fire. I mean, nobody could get out. And, um, you know, Bruce rocked the place. It was incendiary. But the amazing thing of being up there that day. And again, like, how many times had you been there before you covered football? Did you go for a game or something like or games? I think it would I be. Think I want to say, yeah, I want to say I'd been there twice, uh, once or twice for different events. But, yeah, I had not been up there. There was no reason. Look, I'm a Maryland guy. I went to Maryland. I was certainly aware of it. But as you found out, I mean, it's in the middle of the state. It's in Center County. It's in the center of Pennsylvania. That's where you put the state university, right? So people can get to it from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and everywhere else. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a three hour, 15 minute drive from where I live. So yeah, it's not close to anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got up there, I ran into Ross Tucker, at the Springsteen show, giving me peachy Paterno ice cream. So I felt like I had, okay. and I felt like the experience I had would, like my wife would be like, let's go for a game. They're playing Ohio or so whatever, you know, like let's, yeah. let's get tickets. We know people, you know, like we'll figure it out. And I'm like, pain in the ass, the road in, the road in. Now it looks like they've made the road a lot bigger on the way in. Than what I remember. Much, it. Uh, so yeah, it's like going to Ocean City when they fix 50 and you can get there, exactly. right? Yeah, so they've I, done a great job with that over time, for sure. I, so I felt like all of that like is good, but when there's 125,000 people there on a Saturday and they are playing Ohio State <laughs> or whatever, like that's yeah. not like seeing the place. So I really do feel no. like I drove in, 
on a you know on the road there wasn't tail lights we parked we had some chinese food walked around a little bit it snowed randomly sort of whenever it wanted to you you know so i I felt like i had an experience i got my 400 bucks worth and it wasn't just springsteen singing hungry heart i'll promise you you know yeah it's it's interesting one of my good buddies uh pat romano who runs a restaurant about uh, 20 miles Outside of State College, it's called, you'll love this, it's called We Are In, I-N-N. It's a hotel restaurant uh, about 20 miles away. He's a Penn State guy. And he he sent me, after they beat Texas A&M on Thursday, he's saying, do you know when the game is Saturday? Because he had bought four Springsteen tickets for 2000, oh. and he desperately wanted the game to be either the late game or the afternoon he game. And, of course, as you know. It was 7.45 Eastern, so it was the worst possible time. So Bruce went um, on at 7.43. Exactly. There you go. Enough, yeah. enough said. And the game started actually more like 8.15 because the first game went long. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, it was a giant day. I mean, the wrestling team had already clinched the NCAA title the day before because they got up so many wrestlers into the finals. But, yeah, that was a classic State College day. And you'll like this, Nestor. I arrived back in State College a little before 6 a.m., on Sunday, and it, the hotel I always stay at, I called them at uh, midnight, said, hey, do you have any rooms? And I figured they wouldn't because of Springsteen. said, no, but I think we somebody's going to be leaving. We'll find a spot for you. So I got there at 6 a.m., slept a couple hours, and then drove home. Did they give you Bruce's room? I think they did. I did? Yeah, well, you know, I, when it they busted like, out of class. School. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know that Bruce was staying there. Yeah, I'm not sure where Bruce was staying. Was it just a one night thing up there? Was it just Saturday night? It was just a Saturday night, just yeah, in and out of the Short Center. I think he was in Philly a night or two before. So there's a chance he just, I don't know whether he flies or drives or what he does in between uh, places that, that close. But yeah, I, I, there was no evidence that Bruce was in that room, but it could have been Bruce. All right. Well, that's good. Dick Girardi is here uh, talking all things Big Ten and basketball. Where are you on the Terps and what they did this year? You had a chance with your own eyes to see him a couple of times, obviously out at the tournament. And take it from the bottom of where we've already referenced the bottom of Sandusky and how bad Penn State basketball was for like 50 Mm -hmm. years. Uh, But for Maryland and this and I was with Mary, I was with Gary, Gary Land and I'm wearing my state fair shirt all morning uh, today and thinking about and Luke's really big on this about where the ceiling was for the Turgeon program and where the level of expectation was and what could Maryland ever be a Duke, North Carolina? Could we ever be the UCLA, the East again? Um, And Willard in one year has gone one year and three months now from Turgeon dropping the mic before Christmas, Danny May picking it up kids going everywhere the beginning of nil all of this happening and he won a game in the 64 and i mean had they not drawn alabama and not been so awful on the road everywhere they were maybe they could have had a higher seat and 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 dick maybe i'd be calling you for a preview of the maryland east bejesus game this weekend and they'd be in the 16 it's really remarkable in one year what kevin willard has done yeah, I, I thought they overachieved, and I think you got to give credit to the coach. First, he got the guys to stay that easily could have left, given what was going on in the program. And and obviously, bringing in Jameer Young was the key part of it. If, without him, this, none of this is going to happen. They needed to upgrade the point guard position. They did. Uh, the Philly kids uh, – from uh, Roman Catholic and Emma Tep, uh, did a, they were really good for them. I thought they played as well as they possibly could. Yeah, they got a hideous second round draw playing Alabama and Birmingham. I don't think they were going to beat Alabama anywhere. They certainly weren't going to beat them in Birmingham. But I, I think all in all, I think Maryland fans should be pleased. They're in one of the great recruiting areas in the country, in the DMV. No reason that they can't get some of the best players in the area to come to Maryland, the great tradition, the fact who they play, that the gym was electric again this year. It wasn't the last couple of years. They were, I mean, I was down there fairly late in the season. It was a noon Saturday game, and it, it was so really – By then, great. by then the train was rolling. Yeah. And that's yeah. the whole fear the turtle thing. And the thing I talked to Luke a lot about this week, and I was up at Hollywood Casino at the Barstool Sports watching the, the West Virginia game, and there were mm-hmm. people there. And there were people there yeah. that had gray hair like us that were reengaged a bit, taking the yeah. day off, getting some suds, watching sure. the game, and really – 
enjoying the fact that this isn't willed to you that you just get to play every March, that there was turmoil and a lot of change here. And this could have gone mm-hmm. anywhere. And there was no Absolutely. expectation, right? To yeah. your point, like, it's remarkable that they, that they played a couple of games last week, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I think, look, the, the key to the future of the program, obviously, is the kid from Baltimore, Reese from St. Francis. I mean, he, he you could see him, Nestor, over the last two months figuring it out. And I know – Kevin was really upset when he got into foul trouble uh, against Alabama. He said the game totally changed, and he might be right. I don't think they're going to win anyway. Uh, but without him, they had zero chance because uh, Alabama is that good. But yeah, I, I see, I see them heading in the right direction. I think there's room to move in the Big Ten. The league has not been very good for the last three years. The last really good year in the Big Ten was the COVID year where they had, and this includes Penn State, they had three or four teams that could have made the Final Four. Michigan State was sensational. Maryland was really good that year, and none of them got a chance to play. And since then, I mean, it's just been a a nightmare in the postseason. They only have one team in the Sweet 16 again. uh, Purdue gets bounced out by FDU. So the league, I think if you can get more athletic, uh, and get get guys that are willing to play fast. Maryland really couldn't do that this year because they didn't have enough bodies. But if you can play fast and be more athletic, you have a chance to move up dramatically in the Big Ten because it's slow and an unathletic league, and that's been its problem in the postseason. Well, that's – look, that was the reputation in the 80s and the 90s, sure. right? Like, yeah. And Penn State went into the Big Ten years ago, as you pointed out, football and basketball. Mm-hmm. Maryland makes this thing. And at heart, you're a Maryland guy, Dick, right? So um, yeah. you, you've, you're you an old lefty guy. I mean, going, you know, Buck Boy back then, right? So sure. seeing the way the Big East became this brawl 30 years ago and it sort of mm-hmm. got legislated out, what, yep. what will <laughs> legislate or recruit out big white centers in the Midwest, like, I mean, other than they take up soccer, I, you know, like literally, or go somewhere (laughs) else and play somewhere else where they don't want to win in March, but the game has changed. I mean, Steph Curry's changed the game of basketball, right? The way the the game is played, literally. Well, think about this. Zach Eady is probably going to be the national player of the year. If he enters the NBA draft, he can enter it, but he ain't going to get drafted. So that, that that tells you how the whole sport has completely changed. And the Big Ten hasn't changed with it. It's still a big man centric league in, in a sport that's completely changed to the favor of the guards. And it's the one of the reasons why Penn State, the main reason Penn State had its success this year, they were the smallest team in the league. <laughs> Yet they, they uh, decided early on in the first game, Mester, they made 18 threes. That was a school record. They made 18 threes later against Indiana. They, they crushed the old Big Ten Bobby record. Knight wouldn't let him shoot 18 threes. Correct. Right? Gary no, they, would never have advised that in 1994 uh, as no, a fundamental I mean, proposition of basketball, right? It was a whole group of coaches that never adapted to the three, Knight being one of them, uh, Roly Massimino being another, John Thompson. You could go on to the great coaches in the, in the late 70s into the early 80s. They didn't like Once the they, math. They didn't like the analytics in their mind. Right. Right. They, right. And, and, and that's why Rick Pitino is still coaching today at 70 because he figured it out before the rest of them did. And he got a Providence team the first year to three to the final four that never should have happened, but he understood threes. He, his team would make like seven or eight a game. The teams he was playing like Georgetown and, and Villanova wouldn't take five a game. They just, they didn't understand it. They do. Oh, that's not basketball. Well, it is wake up or get, you know, get legislated out. That's what happened to those guys. Uh, but Penn state figured that out this year. Uh, their coach, Micah Shrewsbury, has NBA background. He was with Brad Stevens and the Celtics. He knows the value of the shot. And his players, the best guys on his team, were three-point shooters. So what's he going to do, try to throw it into the post? No, he's good. He's good. Basically, what he did was let other teams score from the post. And he said, well, you can score a lot of twos. We'll score a lot of threes. Add it up. We win, you lose. Dick Girardi is here. I'm going to hold him just bonus time here for just, I, I need a little horse racing from you. And then I have some show yeah. and tell that's very, very uh, significant to your heart and mind as well. So yes, horse racing, where, where, where are we? Give me the horse and Bafford and just honestly, horse racing goes away here for a couple of months. Now, these days, we don't have a sports section here anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, understood. So here's where we are. Forte, uh, the two-year-old champion won the Breeders' Cup. He won his first race of the season, the Fountain of Youth. He'll run again in the Florida Derby in a, in a couple of weeks for Todd Pletcher. If he wins, he'll be the heavy favorite going to Churchill Downs. Uh, 
And you ask about Baffert. Baffert is once again banned from the Kentucky Derby. His ban ends when the race ends this year. He can run horses everywhere else in his own name. He will have something in the Preakness, and he will be there this time. He won't have to be. He won't, he's not suspended anymore just by can't run at Churchill Downs tracks. Uh, so Baffert has, I don't know, three or four pretty good three-year-olds, all being trained now by Tim Yachtin, who will train them through the Derby and then turn them back over to Baffert. And Bob will appear in Baltimore and will go and eat some crab cakes at Michael's while he's watching the horses, uh, the two-year-old, the two-year-olds get ready at Timonium right after the Preakness. So yeah, you will get to see Bob again this year at the Preakness. His best horse, however, uh, Arabian Night Nestor, is off the Derby Trail, two for two. I thought he was the, the horse that was going to win the race. He's got some kind of problem. We will not see him for a while. But remember the name, Arabian Night. He might be the best of the bunch. All right, well, look, hold that Tuesday for uh, Preakness Week or, and Derby Week. We'll get together. So serendipity follows me everywhere I go. You would agree. You, you know yeah, me that, when I was a, an absolutely. oval team. I was a chunky 15-year-old kid when you met me in the News America. I remember it well. You, you remember yes, meeting me. Okay. I, I, absolutely. Okay. So 1984, I meet Dick Girardi, who, by the way, the, our first byline has your – my first byline of Teresa Andrews has your name, Rick Petro's name. You guys were making your picks on your racing because I, I was okay. on page yeah. nine that day, which is where the racing was. Rich right? Petro, one of my men, one of the greats. So you got to come down to uh, the Guinness factory next year when we do the Baltimore sports writer get together, but they always do it on a Saturday and fall. I don't know where you are, but well, you and I, let me know about it. You know, you got, you got my phone. Up. Molly Dunham runs it and I'll, I'll, I'll Molly Glassman. I'll awesome. get up on, I'm on it. We'll get you cool. there. Mark Heim like and all the greats are there. So uh, I went to state college because I got stuck into this ticket that I bought last year. Long story, <laughs> right. I was trying to get rid of it. Nobody. So I, I, I go. I go alone with my buddy yep. Craig. I'm going through Shrewsbury. Yep. Uh, my son's an antiquer. And, you know, I collect uh, old belt buckles, rock and roll belt buckles. Do you know about my collection? Yep. So this I is what I'm wearing that. today. I'm wearing the cars today. Uh, I All wore right. this. I was kind of red for Gary Williams this morning. So, yeah. so <laughs> I'm looking for these in the Shrewsbury antique. And I go in. And, of course, they have sports stuff. I saw a Baltimore Clippers banner that I wanted. Ooh, 75 bucks. Jim West. Beautiful. Jim West. It was orange. It was yeah. legit. Aldo Gwendolyn. It's a little out of my price range of 75 bucks. And then they had this right. this bottle opener that was a skate that had the AHL logo and the old Clippers logo on the other side. Late 60s that literally it was a giveaway and you open bottles with it. It was like for mm -hmm. your bar at your house, right? Yeah. Hell of mm -hmm. a giveaway. Better than any bobblehead, I would think, right? $225. No good. So I go to the back. And they had a 1968 Colt album with Chuck Thompson. It was like 10 bucks. I'm like, I don't have a phonograph yeah. to play it. But, you know, could I put it on the yeah, radio? Yeah. Would we listen yeah. to it? Eh, whatever, right? They, you know, they yeah. didn't even win. So yeah. then I found this. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready for this? Ooh, John Stedman. John my Stedman. Man. You, can you see what it is? It is. Yeah, it's like I open it well, up, dude, and I touch yeah. it like I'm touching like Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones when he was touching his Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'm going to show you this, okay? Ooh. World Series 1966. It says here. The Orioles will win yep. the World Series. John Stedman. This is the souvenir issue. Can you see that right there wow. with the Jetsons bird? Yeah, it looks I like got it. The Jetsons, right? Yeah. yeah. So how much for for? I found this. Yeah. How, this was five dollars, Dick. Yeah. So you buy this, right? You pick it up, right? One hundred percent. Okay. So well, the other thing dollars. that's behind. Hold on. It, this is. This is prior to them sweeping the Dodgers. John Stedman says the Orioles will win the World Series. This is October the 2nd, 1966. John Stedman yeah. says, it says here the Orioles will win the World Series. Pretty, well, pretty prescient. Pretty impressive. Pretty yes, prescient, indeed. I would say. Yeah, so behind is that is the Baltimore yeah. Sun. Orioles yeah. complete sweep of World Series. I got that. I got that paper. I still have it. One nil. Dave McNally. Okay. Paul Blair. Have you ever seen this particular front? Because this looks like a first edition. This looks like the legitimate version of the cover. They never used this cover. There was another picture of McNally ah, and Brooks yeah. jumping into his arms, right? Yeah, so sure. Thinking, yeah. I've never, this is the legitimate, this is the real original one. So I bought them and I brought them home and I didn't open them because I got home at two in the morning because I was driving all yeah. night and there are deer on the road. There was a Taco Bell and, and York. <laughs> so I get home. I don't open them until I'm on the air yeah. with Luke. And I did this as a shtick on the radio Monday morning because, like, it's not <laughs> Orioles season yet. Nobody cares about the Orioles right. yet. 
but they will in a week. And so yep. I broke this out and I opened it and I told the story and I'm like, Luke, I don't know, like, but the original one. And when I opened it, the other papers fell out of it. Wow. There it there is. It is. Yeah, there it is, right. That's the one. The sure. No, I, I, this this, this yeah. is the souvenir. Yeah. This is the one on the mugs and the shirts and yeah. the hats and yeah. the Walmart, right? So, do, and then, do I have, Nestor, Nestor, do I have this right? They win one nothing. Frank hit the home run to win the game. Is that right, Frank Robinson? Hold on, let me get the box score. Hold on. A second. Over Don Drys, I got the box score right here. The box score yeah. right here, the Orioles won one to nothing. And uh, yeah, the home run. Correct. That's correct. Frank there, Robinson, the greatest, there it is. the greatest Oriole of all. So, this was nine dollars. The Baltimore Sun yeah. was nine dollars, and in yeah. it is also the Evening Sun headline. Ooh, nice! All, oh, all of this yeah. for nine dollars, okay? And I oh, and I get to read it. Wow. So then, yeah, the News yeah. American. I open this up, Dick, and <laughs> and when I open this up, yeah. other stuff. It's a thirty-two page. Oh wow! Thirty-two page that? section, and when I open it up. There's a there's a, a a gig in here. I'm figuring little Louie was here. This is the reason I'm in Baltimore is because like sure. my, my goofy cousin played shortstop and he's a Hall of Famer. Aparicio, yep. retire, no no. You like that? <laughs> Nice. Look, is I there like anything it. better than fingering through an old newspaper when you're an old newspaper guy? These smell they smell like the morgue. And you know why they smell like the morgue at the News American? Dick, mm. there's a blue. This, they had color print in 1960. Wow, wow. That's impressive. Three in a yeah. row. One, this is the Sunday one edition. To go. One yeah, to go. I've... This was the headline from the day they won. And here's Wally Bunker firing blanks at those Poe Dodgers. And Stedman yeah. writing about it. In the yeah, I don't think they scored a run in the last three games. Did they, the Dodgers? Bunker's they... arm hurt. Dodgers pained more. <laughs> steady so um when we get together and you and i get cheesesteaks and get grease all over our hands at that joint and we go watch basketball at the great palestra i yes. i will bring these heirlooms awesome. and treasures for you dick gerard and, and, I, and i will take you to joe's in fishtown about five minutes from the palestra and you will be very excited is it going to make me flatulent no okay i'm just checking. No, joe's right. is Joe's had, has it all correct. Used to be up in Northeast. Uh, they closed that place, but they have another place in Fishtown, which is just a little north of Center City. Is Fishtown course, the pig town of Philly? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know Pigtown well enough. I mean, I know where it is, but I haven't been there in so long. I know it's become a, like an upscale kind of a place, right? Which is hard to imagine. But yeah, maybe maybe that's a good analogy. They I got like. great pizza there. Uh, Dick Girardi has great pizza where he is. He's in. The city of brotherly love. The uh, only guy, I, well, not the only guy, because Buckdoll left here too. Uh, but one of the few that left the land of pleasant living for those delicious pretzels up there and all that competitive sports and all of that testosterone that makes Philadelphia, Philadelphia. He's also the voice of Penn State basketball and a Big Ten legend. Dick, I love you. You're one of my originals. You're my OG. And we got to get together soon. All right, Palestra, you and me. Sounds like a plan, Nestor. Let's make it happen. you get the keys to the palestra and you and I could just shoot some baskets there? Would that be fun? I, I, I can get in there whenever you want. Let's do that. That would be like it's like It's not a problem. Be cool. I, I, know, I know the right people. My, hey, look, I'm up I'm up on the walls in there, man. I'm I'm big in that in that joint. Your name's on the wall in the palestra? I, my, my picture is up there, yeah. Yeah, All right, well, I'm coming up. I'm coming. Up. Tommy Conwell. Here's what. Here's what Tommy Conwell is putting the Rumblers back together on the 28th of April, um, uh, up at Ardmore. So, uh, and so if if you could do the April 28th or even the morning of the 29th, I'll get a room and stay the night because Tommy makes That's me fine. drink. Um, yeah. but yeah. I love Philly. Um, you yeah. know, my thoughts to you on losing Super Bowls and 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 World Series. It's it's been it's yeah. Been it was it was a great year with bad endings, but other than that, I mean, they had the best team in the Super Bowl, didn't win, uh, did not have the better team in baseball, almost won. And the soccer team, by the way, lost <laughs> the MLS Cup on the afternoon. The Phillies lost the World Series only in Philadelphia. 1969. You remember it well uh, here. Yeah, 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 I'm sure you yeah, do. That's why yeah, I didn't yeah. buy that 68 season like Chuck yeah. Thompson, Bill O'Donnell. I, like, I understand. Right, you know, I don't it's, need that. It's a great uh, Great team with a bad ending. Yep. Yeah, my dad, my dad, you know, he didn't like that very much. Um, I am Nestor. He was Dick. We've been uh, entertaining you. We are BaltimorePositive.com. Stay with us here at AM 1570.